well, I want to make certain that I give myself enough time and you enough time to learn things that you didn't know before. If you can uh, extract anything out of this, that's possible to learn. So let's go ahead and begin formally. Thank you, uh, men and women of Concordia University who have come to enjoy our inaugural uh, pass at this uh, cultural expose. This is called the museum excursion. And several of you have been with me to go to the Getty Villa, right? Uh, every year that I uh, teach, every semester that I teach, I go to the Getty Villa two or three times a year. I take everybody up to Malibu, to Pacific Palisades, and we look at all of the ancient stuff from ancient Greece and Rome. It's the stuff that I love most, and I try to inspire some of that same love. Um, uh, give me a wave real quick. I see you on the screen. Give me a wave real quick if you've never been to the Getty Villa in Los Angeles. Okay, so when it opens up, and the best I've got on this so far is that they're going to open up in the spring. Of course, everything's day to day with COVID, etc. But I, I go two, three times a term with my students. And if you're in ancient history or mythology or something like that, I force you to go as part of your class so that you can uh, be exposed at least once or twice to the, the best museum around. Uh, when I was talking with my colleagues in the summer uh, about what we're going to do at Concordia University for liberal arts education and thinking about cultural excursions, we can't take people for a movie night, we can't take people to a play if they're closed, and we can't even take people to a museum if they're not allowing public visitors. We bring the museum to us. Dr. Liu, my friend who's the chair of the uh, psychology and behavioral sciences here at Concordia University said, hey, here's a list of all of the museums that you can do virtual tours of. Why don't we put together a night where we can just bring the museum to us? I said, hey, that's a really good idea. I talked about it with Dr. Mallinson and everybody else who's involved with Cui Bono and LLCs as we were trying to plan the semester and the year. And uh, Dr. Mallinson said, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. So uh, next month, November, we're going to do another one of these. And we're going to go to the Prado. We're going to talk about Hieronymus Bosch and some of the weird art there. And uh, as necessity dictates, we're going to continue this practice on so that we can get a little bit of art in front of our face and think about what we can bring to the conversation as we look at sure. some of the greatest things uh -huh. that have ever been painted or sculpted, thought about, and are still on display in our lifetimes. And so this is the first of, of those. It was this like the museum. Tour. There was no crunch in it at all. It I was hear everything that Stefan Christian is saying with all of his friends. And I know that Hannah is embarrassed by this, but don't worry. I already had a conversation with Stefan earlier at lunch today, and I know exactly what everybody thinks of him. All right. <clears throat> so here's the official beginning. Welcome. Welcome this evening to a night at the museum. We're gonna talk about the art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. We're not gonna talk about every art piece there and you couldn't even see everything if you spent a day or even a week there. It's an experience that I hope to bring you virtually at least just a little bit. The bulk of our time is going to be talking about the other Met, not the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but the Metamorphoses of Ovid, because that's some of my love and my expertise in ancient poetry. And I want to talk about uh, some of those mythological stories that are represented in the classical tradition in art. But as we begin our talk about the museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I want to share my screen because we're in a Zoom environment. I can do that uh, with a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation. And by brief, I mean this hour long, the art that we're gonna see, the things that we're gonna think about are all here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which we can experience virtually through a slide presentation uh, with some images. And I also would invite you for the literary and other cultural portion of this to see some literature, which I'm linking to right now. For those of you who are live in the Zoom call right now, I've just linked in the chat bar 
uh, a link to a PDF that is in Google Drive that you have access to if you are part of the Concordia University system. You should be able to see this. Uh, if you are unable to, uh, I'm going to be reading you some passages in Ovid's Metamorphoses uh, uh, about the mythology that's represented by these art pieces that we're going to look at in the second half of the presentation. Um, in fact, since uh, a lot of you are on right now and I can see your faces, did anybody hit that link? Were you able to see a PDF? I sent it this to a staff member. Says I don't have access, even that, though I'm using my school account. Uh, you don't have access even though you have a school account. That makes me sad, but I will forward this on to you. Uh, this is the Lombardo's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, a poem that was written in the first century AD. Okay. Um, I, I will uh, uh, attempt to make it right for you, Beth, and for everybody else that wants to take a look at this. This recording is going to be shared on the Quibono cast later on, and so anybody that is interested in uh, uh, following up with me later on can also email me individually and say, hey, I'd love to have some access to Ovid's Metamorphoses. I don't know how to find it. And uh, email me at clinton.armstrong at cui.edu and I'll be happy to help you out with that. clinton.armstrong at cui.edu. But let me share the screen now uh, with the art that we're gonna be experiencing today in what I'm calling the Met at the Met, the Metamorphoses of Ovid at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, our virtual museum excursion. I assume that everybody can see this screen. Excellent, thank you. And I'm just gonna uh, start a slide presentation. <clears throat> the link is there if you want to type that nasty link or find it in the chat bar and I'll uh, pop it up later for those who may come late. What I'm showing you is a rolling uh, display of artwork that is housed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Some of these you may see uh, and, and recognize, um, like the uh, self-portrait of Rembrandt that was over there on the right. Um, this this uh, uh, first century wall painting from Pompeii that's over here on the right. As, as this scrolls, I wanna talk about museums for a minute. Museums are funny things. On the one hand, they're tourist attractions. Come see our cabinet of curiosities. It's like going to your old crazy Aunt Marie's place and wandering around, scanning the pictures on the walls and wondering whether you're related to these people on yellowing paper or whether your old crazy aunt just hung up those oval frames with the picture that was included in the frame and looking at her old curios and bits of salvaged memories on the whatnot shelf and asking yourself, why did she save this stuff? Somebody's got to love it for it to be held onto. On the other hand, museums are bastions of culture, the place of the muses, those nine mythical daughters of mnemosyne, memory, whose cultivation defines culture in poetry, in visual art, in dance, in history, in scholarship, the public memory of the best of what we've come up with that could survive the wrecks of time, and the savage grind of years, strife, revolution, iconoclasm, domnatio memoriae, a, a Latin phrase that means the erasure of our public memory, and the ephemeral media to which we commit our record. Human culture. But how is human culture the same as what you experience and how is it different? I would say that walking into a museum means that it's quite different. Walking into a museum is a transition in space, not unlike a step into a theme park where our disbelief is temporarily suspended in our invitation to gaze and virtually, yes, virtually, not really, but virtually and vicariously imagine these remains to be relevant and ourselves to be somehow involved 
with that breath of life that reinvigorates these ghosts of someone else's past, maybe even our own, though that may have to wait for the culture to convince us that we are better for having drunk of the collection, that this kind of culture has made us somehow better at being us. And on still another hand, museums are usually about art. And that's a scary thing for an amateur like me, who is not an artist and someone who feels bashful about trying to get to know it and learn to appreciate it. It's hard for a guy like me because I don't like to get it wrong, which is one of the reasons I'm terribly slow at learning languages. And art and appreciation is like a language that I don't know. And I'm often afraid to get it wrong too. I can learn facts about pieces of art. I can describe lines and colors and content and history. I can share feelings and why I like a piece, but I can't pretend that I really know art. Not like some people I know, not like some of you. But that doesn't stop me from enjoying a trip to the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena or the Bowers in Santa Ana or the LACMA in La Brea or especially the Getty in Pacific Palisades near Malibu. And when it's open again, you'll see invites to go with me at least a couple of times a term because the villa is the coolest place ever. And just because we're dealing with COVID these last six months doesn't mean you can't enjoy the museum too. The digital humanities, internet capability brings you to the front of the line without an admission price to experience the stuff that is otherwise inaccessible. Inability to travel is no excuse for not seeing this stuff. In fact, you'd never be able to see the stuff as close up as you can on some really great sites where you can zoom in and zoom out for details of paintings and sculptures. Sometimes even get a 360 degree tour with audio notes on pieces. Next month, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna go to the Prado in Madrid and we're, the, the Louvre in Paris has a virtual tour. So does the Vatican Museum. Do you wanna see the entire Sistine Chapel and zoom in on every picture of Michelangelo's ceiling? You can go for it. Is it the same as being there? No, no, it's quieter. You don't feel like a sheep being herded around every five minutes by a shepherding docent and ducking through every screaming tour group with angry children and hot breath and exasperated parents of every tribe and nation under the sun. It feels like Sunday afternoon in Heathrow Airport. No, you can enjoy the museum on your own device in the comfort of your own cozy space. Incidentally, because I stopped sharing the screen and I see some of your faces here, I asked Jacob Lang, who is uh, my, my student worker for the uh, uh, honors program at Concordia University, I said, hey, where should we go if we're going to do a virtual museum tour? Should we go to the Louvre? The Louvre has 10 million visitors every year. They know that they're the most popular museum in the world. And he says, no, don't go to the Louvre. I've been there twice. I said, what, 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 are, you, what are you saying? You, you want to see the, the Mona Lisa? He said, I didn't even look at the Mona Lisa. Nobody can get in there. Well, if you go to the Louvre, uh, virtually, you can actually see the Mona Lisa in a way that you can't see it when you're uh, worried about 30,000 people trying to see one painting. Isn't that extraordinary? It's sort of like going to game six of the World Series, which is going on right now, right? Some of you decided that you didn't want to watch Los Angeles win it. Uh, uh, others of you said, uh, what's baseball, right? So you, you are here with me who couldn't care less about sports in a, in a COVID year anyway, right? 
but just like the Super Bowl, you don't want to pay a thousand dollars for a seat because you can actually see it a whole lot better on Super Bowl Sunday this February from the comfort of your own television as you eat canapes and, and other things on Super Bowl Sunday at, at your friend's dorm at your friend's house. So also with a virtual museum, you can privately enjoy what is publicly accessible. But still, it's not exactly like being there. And I wish you could go here. I'm gonna share the screen again to get to my little slide presentation because I wanna share with you some pictures of what I got to see when I was here. I had a great time. I had a great time a couple of years ago when I went here to Central Park Fifth Avenue, Manhattan. It was a beautiful day in the middle of my three week trip with some of my favorite people. A couple of years ago on a trip that we call America the Beautiful. On the second leg of our journey, it took us to New York City. And this day, it took us to the fourth most visited museum in the world, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Go to their website and take one of their virtual tours. Is it being there? No, it's not the zoo of crowd and space that you can see in this picture. You don't get the space cadet glow of I'm here with every other New Yorker who got in for a penny. Is it like being there? Yes. There are some similarities. And I'm gonna attempt to give you some of those similarities in my own experience yeah. with just some of the art that's there. It's art that I know more about, the content for, and it's the stories that I love. So I get to see among the millions of pieces in the collection, an interesting subset of what I call the classical tradition. There's a couple of you who are here who are in my mythology class. This is all we talk about is classical tradition. It's what artists for the next couple of thousand years did with the stories that shaped a whole eon of people that I find very interesting. The ancient Mediterranean peoples that inhabited Greece and the Aegean and Egypt and Italy 5,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago. As Stefan Christian, who is, I think, still on this call. Hannah, did he leave? Are you your brother's keeper? You know, Dr. Armstrong, I try. <laughs> Thank you for that. And so shall we all. Let us pray for our brothers and sisters who are not yet on the Zoom call. <laughs> As, as, as I was talking uh, about with them, and I, I think Abigail and, and others who were at lunch, oh, there's Stefan right there, hey! Uh, who, who was it today at lunch who said, yeah, uh, uh, Alexander the Great is dead? I, I forget who that was. That was my roommate, Hannah. <laughs> But Hannah, Hannah yeah. Walker, God bless Hannah Walker. She said, Alexander the Great is dead. I said, yes, yeah, cancel your appointment with him next week. He's not gonna be there. All these guys are dead from 5,000 to 2,000 years ago. But <laughs> they left us something brilliant. It's a whole heritage of a classical tradition that we continue to reinvent and imagine and think about and, and go back to some of us for authority and, and some of us for uh, inquiry and, and science and, and, and thinking about also how we can reinscribe or reinvent or rethink about the myths and the history and the stories of these things. I love that. And museums offer us that too. To do just the kind of thing that I like to do when I go to a museum, frankly, is to limit our tour to just a room or two, just one or two galleries, to just a few pieces of art. And there are so many pieces of art that I'm ignoring. I gave you uh, about uh, 40 or 50 different pieces of art that some of, some of which you recognized, 
uh, Washington crossing the Delaware or, or Rembrandt's self-portrait or Van Gogh's self-portrait or those beautiful paintings by Gauguin or, or, or the sculptures that are there, some of which may be different, foreign to you, maybe even exotic, stuff from Oceania, the, the, the a fetish statue from Hawaii or the Vishnu of India, etc. There's so much that you end up ignoring when you go to a museum. So if you're interested in these things, you have to go back yourself and spend your own time on the things that you like, the things that you're curious about, in eras and places that are worth more time. I invite you to go to the website of the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Throw a topic in the search bar. Throw an artist name or a piece of art that you know, or a geography, or an era and the results will be scads of stuff right at your fingertips, which is free to enjoy and download and zoom in and out of, to manipulate, to copy, to save. It's all free if they put it in the public domain for you. And most of all, free to consider and reflect and compare and digest. One of my colleagues at Concordia University Dr. Dean in, in philosophy, uh, my colleague in Christ College, he sent around an article to a, a bunch of us uh, faculty members that was about the digital humanities. And since COVID, these past six months, how many hits there have been on public museums, people who are stuck at home, what are they looking at? They're looking at the museums more than anything. It's time to think about that as a possibility. If you're stuck on a line, you can still enjoy the culture that's there. It's at your fingertips. This is a public service that museums do for everyone with internet access now. You can't be there, but the museum can come to you. I can't give you everything in an hour or in the next half hour that I've got, right? And I won't try, but I can give you a couple of things that make a connection with me. And the things that make a connection with me are the bits that pick, us, pick up from something that I already have a love affair with. And that's the beautiful poetry from the most beautiful poet ever. That's Publius Ovidius Nasso. Born in 43 BC, died around 17 AD. He wrote an epic poem called the Metamorphoses, which catalogs more than 200 stories of ancient mythology, all united on the theme of change. People turn into birds, people turn into animals, people turn into rocks or spiders. They fall in love, they face tragedy, they get seduced by Jupiter, right? It's all good fun. So when I go into a museum, I already have a context. I have stories that I know and histories that I assume. I think about the human activity of spending time, real time and energy crafting a poem, polishing a statue, painting on a canvas. And I think about how such things are monumental. They last a long time, long enough for me to appreciate it in my own brief lifetime. I don't think immediately of the collection history and the display context. People at museums arrange their collection for a certain effect, to teach something or to display something. And sometimes it's about aesthetics, the theory of beauty. And sometimes it's about wealth, just trying to knock your socks off. And sometimes it's about propaganda and politics too. I had an interesting conversation with Dr. Dean just a few hours ago about natural history museums and the agenda of science and culture that is uh, 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 comparable to making you start at one point and end at another so that you can see a certain kind of scientific progress that is reflective of an, of an ideology. It's just like going to Ikea. If anybody's ever been to Ikea to shop for college dorm furniture, you know that you got to follow the arrows in Ikea so that you can see every single piece so that you get more of your money. The ideology that this underscores is capitalism, right? Uh, there are doors you can like actually not follow the arrows in so that you can get your meatballs a little earlier at the Ikea cafe, which is delicious, right? But if you just... Uh, look at what they're trying to display, you end up getting a sense of their agenda. And that's no different, frankly, 
in museum work than people doing things in private collections, at least since the classical world that I study. People have wanted to collect art for various reasons and some of its wealth and power. There's something about property and ownership and also the troubling question of where do these art pieces really belong? Think about the Elgin marbles that are the marble friezes from the Parthenon of Athens that were constructed under the uh, rule of, of, of Phidias, the architect and artist that are now housed in the British Museum and the ongoing fight between Britain and now uh, Greece about where these marbles really belong. Provenance is a question that's really worth questioning still today. But that's not how I start when I am appreciating the public access to seeing things that I wouldn't know if they weren't buried in the ground or if they were buried in a private collection. But I do think about imagination. That's one thing that I wanna leave with you. Imagining what would lead people to spend their energy and effort interpreting the stories that they know in the way that they express it in art. And here's where I start with the stories that Ovid told in the Metamorphoses. And so as I share my screen again, I'm gonna be looking at the stories from the Metamorphoses. And before I do that, just in case anybody just came on to the Zoom meeting, I'm gonna offer a link here to a, a PDF of uh, a, a few pages of Stanley Lombardo's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses to help you follow along with these, this handful of stories that I'm gonna be talking about uh, from the art and from Ovid's own poetry, uh, that epic poem from the first century, the Metamorphoses. So let's see if I can share this and then go to the first story. Perseus, one of my favorite heroes. If you're in my mythology class, we're gonna be talking about Medusa as a monster for about five weeks as we get trail to the end of class. And what you see here is a statue that uh, was, was carved by uh, an Italian uh, a neoclassicist in the 18th century by the name of uh, Canova. Uh, it's in a huge uh, a sunlit gallery in the middle of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It has some uh, affinities to a Florentine 16th century statue by Cellini, which uh, stands in a major piazza that was constructed deliberately by the Medici family. Uh, but this is its own neoclassical uh, uh, piece. Uh, you see Perseus, the great Argive hero, the son of, of Jupiter or son of Zeus and Danae, his, his mortal uh, lover, uh, who has ended his quest in, in uh, searching for the monster, the Gorgon, Medusa, whose gaze could turn people into stone. You see in his right hand, the harpe, the, the sword with a sickle on it as well. Uh, he's got uh, wings on his feet and wings on his helmet, the gift of the gods that allow him to fly to the places that he needs to go and uh, ultimately uh, complete his heroic quest by severing the head of the mortal Gorgon Medusa to uh, uh, lay it at the feet of the wicked king of Chryseus who has courted his mother. It's an extraordinary statue. This is my own picture of it from a couple of years ago when I was there at the Met. Uh, you see that there's real people there and it's not staged. There's a, there was a big crowd there. I, uh, I took this picture right after I had had a lunch in the Metropolitan Museum of Art snack bar. It was a, a wonderful uh, Caesar salad. I was uh, making certain that as I was getting my uh, 15 to 20,000 steps a day on our America the World Tour that I was also watching my diet. Here's another three quarter view of the same Canova statue. And you get a sense that the mythology that Ovid tells of this story of, of Perseus's hero quest is um, a little troubling because Perseus actually shouldn't be looking at the, the head of Medusa, should he? Because Medusa's head 
her gaze could actually turn people to stone even after her death. It turns out that Medusa's head is also hollow. I'll show you that in just a moment, but I wanted to offer you a detail of Perseus to underscore the fact that when you go to museums online, you can actually get a whole lot closer up than you could otherwise. Um, as, as soon as you start getting this close to a statue, you know that one of the security guards at the Met is gonna come up to you and say, hey, back off, man, go get some more Caesar salad. Notice this, I told you that this, this head is um, uh, hollow. When Canova was making this statue in the 18th century, it was uh, actually becoming sort of faddish with the neoclassical movement to uh, tour people's private collections by candlelight and by torchlight to reenact somehow the excavation of these ancient sites that discovered this kind of art uh, from the ancient world. And so when uh, Canova, the artist who sculpted this statue, uh, found out about that, he started doing private viewings by candlelight. And he actually uh, polished and added uh, uh, different elements to the statue such that it would be seen in half light. Perseus also went on after severing the head of Medusa, as we hear in Ovid's Metamorphoses and uh, other uh, uh, pieces of the tradition that predate Ovid's poem, uh, to go and rescue a princess from Ethiopia by the name of Andromeda. And so I shift here to a piece of art from the first century BC. Uh, this is probably uh, something that was painted on a Roman wall in the first century, in, in the last decade of the first century BC. So you can imagine my Lutheran church related church uh, 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 college students that this painting could have been, uh, 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 have, have the last brush strokes applied to it on the Roman wall in the same moment that the uh, Holy Spirit was visiting Mary and uh, effecting the incarnation of our Lord, 4 BC or 3 BC or somewhere around there. This is contemporary with stuff that is relevant to us in Christianity because it's the Roman world of the first century when Augustus was the emperor. Perseus, you can see over here on the left. Andromeda, you can see locked up here on the right. And Perseus comes and sees a, an injustice being done. Uh, what has happened? Well, the, uh, uh, the queen and the king, Cepheus and Cassiopeia, have been told that uh, they need to sacrifice a, a, a maiden, to sacrifice a virgin for the salvation of their city. Uh, they looked around, they took a straw pole, they couldn't find anybody, but they knew that their daughter had never uh, met anybody. And so uh, uh, they say, okay, Andromeda, it's time to exercise your vocation as the daughter of the king and the queen. Uh, we got to sacrifice you to the sea beast. Now, if you know about movies from the early 1980s, you know this story from Clash of the Titans, right? Uh, the, the Kraken is the one that comes up uh, in, in that movie. The Kraken was never known to the ancient Roman or Greek world. That was an invention of uh, Ray Harryhausen, the, the, the monster magician of that 1983 movie. And so uh, uh, the, the sea monster was gonna come. What does Perseus do? He takes that gorgon head Medusa and shines it in the face of the sea monster and it uh, uh, turns to stone and crumbles. At least that's what's in the movie. In the myth, of course, it's a little bit different. Perseus, as you see in book four of the Metamorphoses, actually has to kill the sea monster with his harpe. And, and this is, this is all good, but what happens to Medusa? Well, the head of Medusa falls into the water. And you see this if you're following along in the PDF, Ovid's own words translated by Stanley Lombardo from book four, his line 831 and following. The victor washes his hands in a basin of water and so the hard sand won't hurt the viperous face. 
He makes a bed of leaves, strews seaweed on top, and rests upon this the head of Medusa, daughter of Phorcus. The seaweed's porous tendrils absorb the monster's power and congeal, taking on a new stiffness in their stems and leaves. The sea nymphs test this wonder on more tendrils and, delighted to find the result confirmed, scatter these tendrils as seeds in the sea. Even now, coral has retained this property so that its stems, pliant underwater, turn to stone once exposed to the air. Isn't Ovid clever? I love that story. I, I, I love the Ray Harryhausen Clash of the Titans movie from the early 80s. I saw it as a second grader in the theater because I had bad parents who brought me to movies like that. Creature features and sand and sandals sort of kind of thing. But I love also Ovid's telling of that. This is where we get coral. It's from Medusa's gaze. A little more Ovid, another story. Who is this? Well, if you're following along in the PDF and you turn the page, you probably already know. This is the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, which he tells in book 10. This sculpture was done by the father of modern sculpture, Auguste Rodin, 19th century. He died in 1917. You know Rodin best as the sculptor who made the thinker. I don't have an image of the thinker. Uh, Le Penseur, right? Uh, the, the guy who is just sitting down and, and he's got his, his chin in his fist and, and thinking. Auguste Rodin made a series of marbles, which the Metropolitan Museum of Art also puts on display. You're going to see another one in just a minute. This uh, uh, sculpture is depicting what we see uh, in, in the later lines of book 10 of Orpheus and Eurydice, where Orpheus, the master musician, has gone to Hades to try to argue for the life of his bride, who has been taken away from him too quickly. He, a widower, is so sad that he goes down to Hades to argue for the life of his bride. And Hades and Persephone, the, the deities of the underworld, are so convinced by his love song, it was a love ballad, that they say, yes, Eurydice can go back, but she will live again so long as you never look back at her until you're back into the upper world. And so you see in Rodin's sculpture that Orpheus is taking that advice to heart. He's got his hand directly over his face, making certain that she won't have to go back. This is my own picture of the same sculpture. I was so excited to see some Rodin, this, this brilliant sculptor, deal with a story that I love so much. And Eurydice looks faint, doesn't she? As if she's just being led along, traipsed along. But the end of this story is actually quite tragic. I'm at uh, Metamorphoses, book 10, in Lombardo's translation, this is line 53. Orpheus received her along with, his, with this condition. He must not look back until he had left the Valley of Avernus, or the gift would be void. The path wound up through deafening silence along a steep, dark slope shrouded in fog. They were approaching the upper rim when the lover, Orpheus, fearing for his partner and eager to see her, turned his eyes. He wanted to look back at her. She fell back at once, stretching out her arms, trying to catch and be caught, and sorry to take hold of nothing but air, dying again. She did not blame her husband. What could she complain of except that she was loved? Do you still have dry eyes right now? Come on, shed a tear. Shed a tear for Eurydice. Shed a tear for Orpheus. She said her last goodbye. Wale! Which he could barely hear and whirled back again to where she had been. His wife had died twice now. And Orpheus was as stunned as that nameless man who saw Cerberus chained and whose fear left him only when his nature did. Oh, what a tragic story. So what does Orpheus do? He decides that he's going to assuage his broken heart the way that 
every good poet does by singing about love. Love found, love lost, love weird, love normal, love with sad endings, love with happy endings. And that's all of book 10 of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Now, he was a great musician. He was the rock star of the ancient mythological world, which is why we have uh, women on this fifth century red figure crotter, a, a wine mixing bowl, who are saying, hey, Orpheus over there with your lyre, the ancient guitar, uh, why don't you come and pay attention to us? But uh, he doesn't want to. He still just wants to keep singing his songs. What does he sing songs about? The only happy ending in all of Ovid's Metamorphoses is this story right here. Another Rodin sculpture. And what do we see here from book 10 of Ovid's Metamorphoses? This is the celebrated story of Pygmalion. Pygmalion who looked at all the women around him and said, you ladies don't have anything for me. I'm, I'm, I'm sick to death of the fact that you don't know about virtue and vocation. You probably didn't go to Concordia University. And I'm nowhere near Southern California. So all I can hope to do is carve my own sculpture. And so he did. He carved a sculpture of a woman. And the fates would have it that he ended up falling in love with his own creation. Hmm, maybe this is about art. Maybe this is about the writing of poetry. Maybe this is about the experience of every artist. I know it's the experience of me when I make dinner for my family, I'm always in love with my own cooking, even if nobody else likes it. But this is true of Pygmalion as well. He creates the statue and he falls in love with it. He starts dressing it up. He starts buying it jewelry. He starts calling it pet names. It's kind of creepy, but it's kind of cute also. And then there's a festival of, of Venus, the Roman name for Aphrodite. And at that festival of Venus, he offers a prayer, a votive. He wants to pray, give me my statue as the one who's going to love me forever and the one that I get to love forever. And he can't quite get that out. He says instead, give me one like my ivory maid. You see this in Ovid's Metamorphoses, uh, uh, in, in Metamorphoses book 10, uh, in, in Lombardo's translation around line 303. His prayer is, oh gods, if you can grant all things, my prayer is that I may have a wife. He didn't dare say, my ivory girl, but said instead, someone like my ivory girl. The poetry goes on in something so beautiful. He gets back to his house, bending over, line 311, he gave his statue a kiss. She seemed to be warm. He kissed her again and touched her breast with his hand. The ivory was growing soft to the touch. I told you it was a little creepy, but it's a little cute too, right? As it lost its stiff hardness, it yielded to his fingers. The Hymetian wax softens under the sun and can be kneaded and molded by the thumb into many forms in use, growing through use. The lover is astounded, cautiously rejoicing and fearing he's mistaken. He tests his hopes again and again with his hand. It's a real body. The veins were throbbing under his thumb. Our Paphian hero poured out thanksgiving to the goddess Venus and then pressed his lips onto real lips at last. The girl felt the kisses and blushed. And in the next two lines of Latin, my sisters and brothers at Concordia University, these are a couple of my favorite lines in the Latin language. It's so beautiful. Listen to this translation. The girl felt the kisses, blushed, and lifting her shy eyes up to the light, took in the sky and her lover at the same time. She saw heaven and her lover in one gaze. The Jerome painting that you see here that comes in many versions is also housed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I know it's a little risque because you see a little bit of naughty bits and whatnot, but it's so archetypical for our Western tradition of thinking about this story that I couldn't help but give you the kiss from Jerome. All right, I know that my time is growing short. I love talking about these stories, but I wanna to get to a couple of others. 
Orpheus continues to sing these love songs in book 10 of Ovid's Metamorphoses. And the last one that he tells is about Venus and Adonis. And you see them here depicted by the 16th century master, the Renaissance master Titian, Tiziano, Titian. And you see Venus in this weird uh, contra pose. You see her back. It, it's as if she was sitting up front to the left. But uh, uh, Adonis, the, the one that she fell in love with because she was grazed accidentally by one of her son Cupid's arrows, she falls in love with this mortal man, Adonis, says, Adonis, I know you love to hunt. I'm going to go hunting with you. Uh, the text says that Adonis used to hunt some of the big game and, and Venus, you know, with her little bow and arrow, she would hunt like squirrels and rabbits and, and small game like that. It's kind of cute. But she says, don't hunt the big game. Don't go after boars. Don't go after deer. Don't go after lions because it's very dangerous. And I'm going to tell you a whole story about it. And the story she tells is the story of Atalanta and Hippomenes, the guy who uh, fell in love with a, a woman on the track team. And, and then in order to catch her, he had to throw some golden apples so that she'd slow down, trip over the hurdle and pick up the golden apples. And then, so that's why they ended up getting married. And the end of that story is all simply about how they turned into uh, uh, lions later on because they were uh, doing things in a cave that they shouldn't be doing. In, in any case, she says, that's the proof that you shouldn't hunt the big game because it's dangerous. But you see here, Adonis going after the big game and poor Venus trying to keep him away from danger. I, I give you that story in the rest of this book 10 business. And you read it in Ovid's Metamorphoses, book 10, starting around in Lombardo's translation, or around line 625 or so. Be brave, says Venus, with prey that runs away, like the squirrels and the rabbits that I like to hunt. Boldness isn't safe with bold animals. Do not be rash, dearest boy at my expense. And don't challenge those beasts that nature has armed, or your glory may come at great cost to me. Neither youth nor beauty, nor anything that has moved the goddess Venus, moves bristling boars and lions, or touches the minds of things in the wild. A boar's curving tusks strike like lightning, and a lion's angry charge is just as bad. I hate animals like that. Well, this is all foreshadowing. Guess what happens to Adonis? Poor Adonis gets gored in the groin by a wild boar, and he dies, bleeding out, while Venus can't save him at all. But she can do something. Ovid says at the end of book 10 that she turns him into a flower, the anemone that is here today and gone tomorrow, but the petals also form letters that say A-I-A-I, I, -I. I, I, like somebody who is mourning for her lover. The very last story that I want to offer. Oh, uh, sorry, this is Peter Paul Rubens working on uh, the same theme a century later, uh, working with the same kind of uh, a Renaissance uh, theme that Titian was working with into the late Renaissance and Baroque period. We've got the master Peter Paul Rubens working with Venus and Adonis. I love how this little Cupid is hugging the leg of Adonis and poor uh, Venus, whom you see now from the front, uh, is, is essentially in the same pose, yet from the back as Titian had offered. I know we're at the end, so I wanted to offer one last startling picture of human agony. And this is in book six of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is the story of Marcius. And again, one great story about why not to compete with the gods. Don't ever go up against Apollo if there's a music contest. The fawn, Marcius had said, I bet you I'm better at playing the flute than you are. And Apollo said, okay, what do you wanna bet? And the wager was, hey, uh, let's uh, uh, say that whoever wins get to, gets to punish the other one as much as they want and in as any way that they want. So Apollo said, all right, uh, they shook hands on it. And Marcius played his flute and then Apollo played his flute. And Apollo, it turns out, was the better flute player. So what's the punishment? Marcius, the one who's depicted in this agonizing statue by Permoser in the uh, later 19th century, is flayed 
alive. Now, for those of you who don't know, if you're playing the home game, what flayed means, it means that while he was alive, he was bound hand and foot and his skin was removed from him. And if you had your skin removed from you, your face might look like this too. I'd like to ask you to pop on if you're uh, uh, playing live with me, pop your mic on and tell me, what do you hear when you look at this statue? What do you hear when you look at the Marcius? At that point, if that was like me, I don't, I think I would have exhausted my vocal cords to the point that I'd be screaming, but no sound would be coming out. <laughs> yeah, that's wisely said. Absolutely. Look at the anguish in the eyes. Look at the skin and the wrinkles underneath the eyebrows. Look at how close the bones and the veins and everything is coming up to the skin of this fawn's face. Look at the cave of the mouth and the hole in the ear. Look at the flame in the hair of this statue. Look at this from a couple of different views and realize that the tongue that you see over here on the left is actually half of a tongue, which shows that either his punishment was to have his tongue shortened, cut off by divine wrath and retribution, or else his pain was so great that he actually bit it off himself. Hey, what else do you see in this in this sculpture? What else do you see in this portrait? Besides just the anguish of the face. What's around his neck? What's that creature? Let's let's talk about what's down here below his neck first. It looks like a, a cloak of some kind, right? And then you've got this creature here. If you follow around the entire sculpture, you see that it's all of one piece, as if it's one large cloak that is then connected to this creature, this otherworldly, almost demonic. It looks serpentine, it looks leonine, it looks destructive. I believe it's supposed to be a symbol of the underworld where he is going to his death. But that then raises what is the method of his death? What's coming off of the sculpture here is actually not meant to be his cloak, his clothing. It's meant to be his skin. You're right, Ruth. That is his skin being removed. Oh, I wanted to uh, offer you that as, as the last piece. You're not just seeing things. When you're at the Met, you can hear a lot of people. You hear the mumble behind you. You hear all the muttering. You hear all the conversation. But when I see this sculpture, I can hear nothing but Marcius's unhuman scream. Well, there you go. Isn't it great to have Ovid a little bit for uh, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Met at the Met? I don't know if you, that ends with good news or bad news, but I wanted to end with something emotional and uh, pretty rife for interpretation. But my friends and neighbors, I've left us with a, a good six minutes until 6.30 when you can say, oh, I don't want to look at art with Dr. Armstrong anymore. This got too creepy or it got too cute. I don't know which one you'd think, but I'd love to hear what you have questions about. Incidentally, with all of this art, with any piece that you saw at the front roll, or this back stuff with my Ovid stories from the Metamorphoses or anything else mythological or anything else about the, Met, uh, about the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm happy to follow up with you later, happy to share links with you, happy to share this presentation with you. And as I said, Dr. Mallinson is going to throw this on to the Qui Bono cast so you can enjoy it later on as video, not just as audio. Thanks be to God. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to see things, to hear things, and this is your opportunity to say things, ask things, get into conversation with each other or with me. What you got? We also have why a chat card. Why did you pick the pieces? Why did you pick the pieces that you did? I picked the pieces that I did. Number one, because they were at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 
Number two, because I thought that they were extraordinary. I got to see them and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a great story. And I love that story. As I said earlier, Jacob, uh, I have a context going into things. I love to learn things that I don't know. I love to learn things I never knew before but I really need a teacher. I need somebody to help me out with not just art and appreciation, but what's the context of this? What's the history of this? When I look at this stuff, I say, mm, I know what's going on here. And I, I can track that through in classical tradition. This is one of the things that I try to impress on my mythology students too, is that we still do these things. I'm looking at uh, right now uh, 12 different faces besides my own on the Zoom call. And I know at least 10 of you have heard of Percy Jackson or have read Percy Jackson, seen the movies, boo, love the books, yay. And, and we, we still talk about these ideas in our exponent of Western civilization. So I think it's always a great form. If I'm gonna be given an hour to talk about anything, I'm gonna talk about the stuff I love, which is mythology, Western Civ, classical tradition, and especially Ovid. That's one of the reasons I picked these. Thanks for the question. What else you got? What else are you thinking about when you see this stuff? Oh, there is chat. And I'm glad to see that you, you've got the chat going on thought that the skin was being removed? How long would it take for some of these sculptures to be made? Sometimes five years, all right? So that, that uh, uh, Perseus with the head of Medusa that we saw, that was a five-year process from the beginning to the end. Uh, that's an extraordinary investment in time. What I said earlier about imagining why somebody and how somebody could justify spending the kind of time that they do with a painting, with a sculpture, or with anything, that's an extraordinary thing. Uh, uh, sometimes take, take a very long time. Abigail, are you moving your hands like this because I'm moving my hands like this? Are you mocking me while I'm uh, talking with my hands? I don't know, maybe you are. Maybe you're not even listening. That's all right. Yeah, they have a bunch of extra time. How do sculptors, how do artists, how does a poet, how does anybody who's gonna spend the time doing this, how does she make her living? How does she eat? How does he make a, a, a possible life for himself? You need patrons people who are willing to say, this is important in our society, this is important in my family, this is important in our community, that we have art. And it's not an, an easy thing to do in the ancient world. It's not an easy thing to do in the medieval world, in the feudal world. It's not an easy th thing to do in, in a place that uh, uh, runs on capital like we do, because you have to ask, okay, now what's going to sell? And we, we can't really talk about art for art's sake when we're talking about a market for these things in our modern day. It's different in other eras. It's different in other communities. Many of these pieces are familiar from your Valentine's talk last spring, says Kimberly Bullen. Did I give a Valentine's talk last spring? Are you talking to me when you say Valentine's talk? Hmm, is this because Ovid was especially focused on such romances or are they just your favorite? Maybe I'm like Ovid. I'm a sucker for love poetry and love songs and things like that. Uh, as, as those who have done poetry with me know, it's not the only kind of poetry there is. Most of my teaching is done with epic and tragedy and things like that. So if you get an opportunity, uh, instead of listening to opera all day long, sometimes it's nice to turn on some Frank Sinatra. <laughs> That's why I, I do this, especially for Valentine's Day, but it has its place, doesn't it? Is Ovid writing serious po poetry? Absolutely he is. This is absolutely serious poetic experiment, but some of it also has to do with something true to the heart of all of us. We experience love, we experience association, we experience loss and tragedy, and sometimes in a very small amounts, we can also experience joy, ecstasy. Uh, and yes, they are some of my favorite stories. I think book 10 of The Metamorphoses is certainly my favorite book today. Tomorrow it might be book six. It's, that's pretty great too. But uh, all of them, all of them are great. If you'd like to read some of those with me in English, okay. If you'd like to read some of those with me in Latin, by all means, let's do it. I'll even give you a, a registered credit for a Latin 301 class. And with Latin 101 and 102, we can get through a book of Ovid's Metamorphoses in a semester. Let's do it. I have an open invitation for you. Hey, does anybody else have a question, comment, challenge, outright revolution, stories of your childhood, poems that you'd like to share, any artwork that you'd like to talk about? Jake, how, 
how do you think these kind of sculptures um, add to the mythic tradition of some of these stories? I'd love to push that back on you. How do you think they do? But of course, then you'd be writing a 30 page paper for my mythology class, right? How does the classical tradition do this? I think we reinvent these things, we reinterpret these things, and I, I'm gonna uh, be solid on one answer that's good, I think, for everybody who loves Percy Jackson, or like me, you love the monster movies of 1980s, right? Or anything else that has to do with poetry or talking about myth. There are some people that say, oh, this is the authentic myth, or this is the authorized version of the myth, or this is what's canon and everything else is just somebody else's fantasy. What do I say? I say every myth is in the telling. We're always telling the story in our own way. And we do that for very good reasons. Some of those are social reasons. We, we are, are creatures of the people who are around us and the institutions that shape us. And we have to reinterpret these stories that are universal. It's hard to invent anything new, frankly, but we can take from the past and not consider that there's only one authoritative version we can reinvent that to make it practical, useful, relevant, and beautiful, above all, beautiful for our own day and age. Every myth is in the telling. Everybody say it with me. Every myth is in the telling. We'd have to surprise firm somehow during the revolution. I have no idea what Hannah's saying at all there. You have now dipped into your brother's error. Okay. Uh, it goes back to Ruth's comment. Oh, to, uh, what was that? There's more going on in chat than I can keep up with. That's oh, great. Well, you had mentioned something about a revolution. And so Ruth asked, is it truly a revolution if you condone it first? And I said that we'd have to surprise you somehow during the revolution. Oh. And Kimberly suggested that we lure you into a trap with a rare edition of Ovid, but or Ovid, but now. Listen, if you ever find a rare edition or a manuscript or anything like that, I promise I'll give you the credit. Let's publish it together. I'll help you out. I think that's exciting, exciting stuff. <laughs> With that, guys, it's 6.30 p.m. And uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, stop the official recording now so that Dr. Mallinson has something to throw up on the uh, Cui Bono cast.